Well, um, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Xiao Damao Clark, Vice President of Hilton Alumni Association. Uh, this event is a partnership between the Alumni Association and the Hilton faculty members. On behalf of all Hilton alumni and students, I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the seven professors who will be speaking today. And a housekeeping item, all the participants uh, except the moderator and the panelists video and audio are disabled to ensure everyone can see and hear the speakers. To submit a question, please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You will type your question into the box. Please include your first name and graduation year if applicable. If your question is selected, you'll be promoted to a panelist and asked to turn on your video and audio to ask your question. Uh, we have a lot of participants today. Uh, I want to apologize in advance that we will not be able to answer everyone's questions. If you have any suggestions for future topics, please uh, type in the Q&A box as well. Um, and also please join the Alumni Association for Virtual Tequila, tequila Learning and Tasting event on Thursday, July 30th at 5.30 p.m. Uh, I'll type the registration link in the chat box. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce the moderator, Dr. J. Watt Kim. Dr. Kim is an assistant professor at the Hilton College. Before joining the Hilton College, he was an assistant professor at St. John's University in New York. His industry experience includes diplomatic public services, convention management, casino, and gaming management. Dr. Kim got his PhD at Iowa State University, where he received the Teaching Excellence Award and the Teaching Award for Outstanding Teaching Performance. He is the author of more than 16 peer-reviewed journal articles and conference proceedings. Dr. Kim specializes in strategic management, casino and gaming management, and entrepreneurship. Thank you so much, Dr. Kim, for moderating the session today. Thank you so much, Xiaodan, for uh, introducing me well. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, the Hilton College Alumni Webinar hosted by Hilton College Alumni Association. And thank you for being here with us, all audiences and, and panelists. My name is Jeo Kim again, and I'll be a moderator of today's webinar. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in distinctive implica uh, implications for the global public health and economy due to its unprecedented scale of impact on every aspect of human life. So as of today, I just found it that uh, nearly 15 million cases have been confirmed and 600 and 1800 thousand deaths in nine, 195 countries, which is extremely severe, and 3.9 million confirmed cases only inside of the United States. To contain this pandemic uh, coronavirus, travel and mobility restrictions and lockdowns have been ordered, and also the personal and self-preventive measures such as social distancing, self-isolations, and limited business restrictions have been imposed as well. However, this social method resulted in devastating impacts on the economy, including the hospitality and, in, and tourism industry. So uh, to uh, dive deep into the current situation and what will be the next in our industry, uh, I invited, we invited uh, actually six panelists uh, who are experts in hospital, restaurant, uh, food safety and sanitation, uh, hospitality, education and service industry. So uh, from now on, under this uh, devastating impacts of pandemic, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Suzata Sursat, who is assistant professor of Hilton College, uh, to explore uh, more about the coronavirus and safety and sanitation issues. Thank you for being our uh, panelists today, Dr. Sursat. And uh, my first question, and the first question that we would like to ask is, can you talk a little bit about the virus itself that causes COVID-19? and its mode of transmission and what we know and what we are not knowing well about it. And also it will be better for us to know more about how we actually respond to uh, this disease for our own safety and health issues. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I appreciate the question and thank you for um, including me as part of this session. I am very excited to hear what all the panelists have to say. Um, I'll start out by sort of unpacking your uh, question a little bit, um, and let's start first talking about the virus uh, very briefly. 
Um, so the current um, virus that we are dealing with uh, is called the SARS-CoV-2 uh, or SARS-CoV-2, um, and it stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. Um, it belongs to the same family of coronavirus uh, that we may have heard of uh, earlier in 2002, 2003, uh, there was the SARS outbreak um, in China and uh, the MERS, the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome uh, outbreak uh, that happened in Middle Eastern countries in 2012. So it's the same umbrella of viruses, if you will. Um, this particular virus that we are dealing with in this current pandemic causes a illness called COVID-19 or Coronavirus Disease 2019. Um, and typically the, the most common symptoms are uh, coughing, shortness of breath, um, in some cases, respiratory distress. Um, there's also some uh, sort of outlier type symptoms that are um, loss of um, uh, the ability to smell. Um, so the loss of, um, you know, not being able to basically smell, uh, which, which wasn't the case before uh, in a person. Um, and also in, in some rare instances, diarrhea. Uh, so gastrointestinal type uh, issues. Um, one of the things with... Um, you know, when it comes to the mode of transmission of this virus, it's respiratory. So um, it, it, you know, through respiratory droplets, which are about five nanometers um, big, pretty heavy, it typically sort of drops to the ground about three feet distance from a person. Um, and that's why the CDC guidelines for social distancing is six feet uh, apart. Um, the things that we don't really know um, about uh, the, um, the, the current um, virus and the illness. Um, the one thing uh, that sort of stands out is the number of asymptomatic cases. Um, so people who are tested for this virus uh, oftentimes uh, do not demonstrate any symptoms. And studies have shown that can be anywhere between 25 to 40%. Some studies as high as 45%. Um, which is very scary because you could have a person with like who feels completely healthy um, have the virus still be able to you know transmit it. Um, and the other thing that's odd um, that still needs more studying is the severity of uh, the illness can vary very uh, you know vastly. Uh, some people demonstrate like I said no symptoms. Some have mild symptoms. Some can have organ failure, limb amputation, and the very extreme case is. Um, from a public health standpoint, um, you know, I, I'll just mention four things very briefly. Uh, one is the importance of social distancing, right? So the six feet apart. The second is mask up, very important. Um, more and more uh, studies have uh, demonstrated. There was a study that came out of UC Berkeley that showed that if 80% of the population wore masks, we would be able to flatten the curve and not... Um, overwhelm the hospital system. Whereas if only 50% of us, the population wore masks, then we would still be burdening the hospital system and not be able to flatten the curve. So masking uh, up is very important. Um, depending on where you are, especially if it's a hot zone like Texas, Arizona, Florida, California, um, it's very important to sort of stay home if you can. If there's any way that you can you know, still be home um, and be able to work from home, that's very important. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention um, is wash your hands like your life depends on it, because that is one way we can effectively sort of, um, you know, reduce the risk um, when it comes to spreading this virus. Thank you, Dr. Sersen. Based on your suggestions for uh, kind of uh, the individual safety and health uh, kind of the policies, what would be the best recommendations uh, based on the scientific standpoints of yours? for food service industry as well, because many of us are having a concerns regarding the possibility of transmission uh, via food or food contact services. So could you share any recommendation to us? Sure, so from a food service standpoint, um, you know, as food service operators start pivoting, have started pivoting towards, uh, you know, delivery options, uh, pick up only options. Uh, there are a few things to keep in mind. I'm going to mention four very briefly. Uh, one is the possibility of transmission via fomites or inanimate objects, which is basically think doorknobs, right? Door handles, surfaces, uh, like table surfaces. Um, the, the risk of that, uh, like I mentioned before, the highest risk is really respiratory droplets. But the risk of transmission via inanimate objects, while very, very low, 
is still there. So the emphasis on cleaning and sanitizing needs to be very high um, when it comes to, you know, uh, food service operations. We also want to, again, think about, you know, personal hygiene, which basically I'm just going to talk about two um, under personal hygiene. The first, again, is hand washing, um, making sure, you know, we drive home the point to employees. It's very important to wash your hands, but also uh, the importance of staying at home if they feel unwell. Um, is, you know, specifically when it comes to any sort of either foodborne symptoms or COVID related symptoms, right? Um, the third thing that I want to talk about very briefly is, um, you know, I, we talked about the risk of transmission is mostly respiratory through um, droplets. However, um, earlier in July, the World Health Organization released a report saying that there is a, a risk of airborne transmission, especially in very closed sort of environments uh, where the ventilation isn't very good, right? So uh, focusing on the HVAC system, making sure that it's working well, the ventilation is good, um, and your, um, you know, your tables are apart at least six feet. There was a study that came out of uh, the CDC in China that looked at a restaurant um, where in 15 days, there were 83 people who got COVID-19. And uh, they basically identified that it was because they were in these closed spaces. There, there was, you know, there was a problem with the air circulation and the tables were too close together. And the last thing I'm gonna uh, point out is two resources uh, that may be helpful for food service operators. Uh, the first one is the FDA, FDA's uh, reopening guidelines for food service. Um, it's basically a checklist that talks about things like, you know, facility operations after you've been closed for quite a while. It talks about water, ice, talks about cleaning, disinfection, the importance of social distancing and employee health when it comes to reopening. Um, and it's a really nice checklist. It's a, sort, it, it's a good starting point for food service operators as they begin, begin opening um, either during a pandemic or you know, once it settles down. Um, and then there's also something called the Texas Restaurant Promise that's built off of the um, FDA guidelines. Uh, that's basically created by Texas restauranters um, of various sizes and the FDA, along with public health officials from around the country. That's a, that's a really nice sort of document that can also help restauranters sort of open up, but also um, it provides uh, sort of a guidance for consumers as well as customers when you go back, um, you know, show, show back up at restaurants, what are the things that we need to keep in mind? Um, so that the, the TRP, the Texas Restaurant Promise, documents that as well. Thank you so much for sharing. Great source of information for both food service industry personnel and this individual who are living in the new normal. Once again, thank you, Dr. Sarset. With these traits and characteristics of the coronavirus in our world, many industries are responding to overcome this devastating situations. One of the severely damaged industry is definitely hotel industry. So from here, I would like to invite Ms. Arlene Ramirez, Assistant Professor of Hilton College, to discuss more about hotel industry. Thank you, Ms. Ramirez, for being here with us. Uh, first and foremost, how is the pandemic affecting hotel industry? That would be the best, uh, the, the, the most important question. And also, what are current strategic approach to secure the profitability for long-term uh, business operation uh, for their uh, the business sustainability in hotel industry. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this prestigious group. I'm very honored to be, be here today. Obviously, the hotel industry has been hit extremely hard, and there's so many different dynamics involved in it. Right now, we're looking at this year, possibly, if things continue to go somewhat better, ending in an occupancy overall in the mid 40s with a rate just slightly above $100. So that's that's not great. And it's every sector. So it's not as one sector is doing better or worse. And, and then a little later, I'll explain where things are looking a little better. One of the things that we're seeing is that a lot of hotels are just trying to work on breaking even. That's the goal. It's let's break even. 
But what is interesting is that while we know how to control costs, we've been very good at it over the last couple of years. We've gone through several economic situations. So we've learned how to be efficient. Uh, Dr. DeFranco is going to talk about technology later, but we've learned how to integrate technology. We've learned how to manage costs. Labor was an issue before the pandemic. We couldn't find enough people. So we were learning how to do jobs with less people. Well, now the pandemic hits, we, we lay everyone off. We tried to open the hotels. We're finding that while we may be saving in some areas, we have this new additional cost that now we have to face. So what we're seeing is that hotels are uh, experiencing anywhere from 15 to 20% increase in costs related to all of the things they need to comply with the stay safe cleaning um, philosophy that we've either implemented through our companies or through the American Hotel Association. And that's important because if we can't communicate to our guests that it's safe to stay in the hotel, that it's clean, that it's sanitized, they're not going to stay with us. So you're, you're having to take a lower rate. You have to maybe bring in more people to clean in less rooms. And you're having this additional cost of either more sanitizing equipment, you have the masks, you have to have the gloves, temperature checks, all of this. So while we've been able to be great at managing, now we have less volume and more cost. So if you remember back to your first accounting courses, break even means that your revenues and your costs, your variable costs, you know, have enough to cover your fixed costs. And we're, we're not having enough to cover those fixed costs. And some of the additional costs we're having to spend, and it's not necessarily a P&L impact for profitability, but it's a cash flow. And cash is king, right? So if you have no business, there's no cash. So you can't buy stuff you need. And what we're having to do is buy some of those, it, I, and, and forgive my terms, Dr. Uh, Serrata probably knows the machines, ionizing, whatever, you go and you blast all the germs away. We need those now, right? We need uh, covers, the plexiglass that we have to put up in some places. We have to look at the food dispensing. How do we do that in a safe way? So there's a lot of capital expenditure at a time where there's no money. So it's, it's a big impact. And as we see, break even is not a way that we can manage for a long period of time. And so what's, what we're gonna start seeing soon, and already there's, uh, in reading some of the statistics, there's about 2% of uh, loans that are back through securities that have already been in default. And the thought is that there's gonna be more, and those are just the ones that are backed by securities. And we, we don't know, I don't have a number for you yet on how many bank loans have actually defaulted yet. But there was one article that said there'd be about 4,000 uh, hotel loans defaulting before the end of the year. And so there's good and bad in that. We went through this in the 80s. I was but a baby back then, but some may remember that we had um, a government entity, the real estate investment, not, the, I, I forget the name exactly now, it just left my mind, but where the government bought some of these assets and then we had to try to, you know, um, see how we could reuse them, right? So one good thing that we may not see, we may not see that happening uh, now because banks are much tighter on how much can be loaned uh, equity versus debt. So you have to put a lot more money down in order to get a loan, it's not all debt. So um, banks sort of secured themselves in that, in that sense, so they don't have a huge exposure. But there's going to be a lot of hotels in a lot of locations that are not going to be a viable investment anymore. So not a pretty picture, but there are some positives. Um, we are seeing that if you have a demand generator near you, that you're going to do OK. Galveston, for example, here in Texas, they're probably seeing better occupancies than you're gonna see in downtown Houston. So people are wanting to get away and go someplace and they feel safe at the beach. Now we closed them over the last holiday, but they're open again. The also is interesting is a trend that people are, which may not be great for hotels, but people are looking at vacation rentals. So you're seeing an uptick in, while many thought Airbnb might not do well during this time period, type of organizations like that, Airbnb, vacation uh, rental by owner, 
are doing exceptionally well because people feel comfortable that they're in a home. They're not around other people. If they want to cook, they can bring their groceries and they could still have that vacation experience, but somehow feel a little safer. And so they also, these organizations also have implemented cleaning protocols that match the hotels. So that adds a little to the uh, impact on hotels. You're having more competition from that standpoint. But I think what we're going to see is that hotels are going to do well, again, if they're in a demand generating area, a beach, um, uh, some type of amusement area. Perhaps we're going to see a little bit more activity near the airports. Once we start seeing more there, we're going to see that, that things are coming around. But it, it's going to be a tough stretch. And Houston, in particular, is going to take a little bit longer. We are going to have a problem because we don't, we're not going to see the group business grow like we're going to see the transient. The group business is going to be very slow coming back because companies are not allowing their people to travel. So we have to find ways that we can be ingenious to get these groups to meet in the hotels, even though they're not traveling. So maybe the company doesn't have the technology they need. Um, repurposing hotel rooms, maybe some to residential for people that need to come to a location and work um, and stay long term. So one of the things that we're seeing is that hotels that are being ingenious, that are trying to do virtual meetings, virtual weddings, those types of things, they're going to fare well. So the time now is not to sit back and, and say, whoa, is me. The time is now is like, whoa, what did I think of? I got to do this. I got to move forward. We got we to gotta get beyond break even. Thank you so much. Uh, one more thing about uh, the efficiency and profitability of the hotel industry. I read a news articles regarding the employment, actually. More than 70% of them are unfortunately laid off or followed right now. And that exactly relates to the profitability of the hotel in, uh, companies as well. So uh, based off of what you've discussed just before, could you share uh, brief comments about how you actually foresee the efficiency and profitability of the hotel companies and hotel industry in the post-pandemic world? Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, we were pretty good at managing our costs. We had done some great things using technology because, again, we were having the other experience. We couldn't find enough people. We had a lot of opportunity, we just didn't have enough people. So I think what's going to happen is we are going to slowly bring people in as the demand comes up, but you're going to need to build the, the sales team. You're going to need to bring in people to stay at your hotel. You're going to need that ingenuity. So they'll be hired back, but it's going to be a slow process. And we have to figure out how long we're going to have to institute all of the cleaning protocol. So if you get a vaccine, say in December, so there's some news outlets that are saying that we might have a vaccine from December. Do we all get vaccinated in January 1? Boom, we're back in business. We're just rolling and, and going. I don't think so. A lot of companies have reduced their labor force and have forced people to work from home. And some of them are finding efficiencies in that way. Um, I know one company who has totally renegotiated their lease, gotten rid of it, and everyone's working from home and they are not going back to a building. So how do you get them back into the hotel? So there, I think there's going to be opportunities, but you have to be creative in that. So that company who got rid of their, their lease and everyone's working remotely, they have to meet. Once, once things get back to normal, they're going to want to meet face-to-face. -face. Where can they do that? Let's, let's, let's get them into the hotel. We can provide them food. We, can provide, we have sanitation. All, everything's worked out. The question is, how long is it going to take for this vaccine? How long will it take for this to kind of go away? And then slowly but surely, we're going to see the demand come back because people want to meet, people want to see each other, people want to go on vacations. I'm ready to go. So I know others are too. So it's just a matter of how long it takes us to get to that point. But I think you're starting to see people venture up, you know, and, and if we can keep the numbers plateaued, I think people will start venturing out a little bit more because they'll feel safer. So I didn't really give you an answer, but I sort of did. <laughs> but it's really good to get kind of the positive kind of the, the prediction of yours. So hope that could be uh, our uh, near future industry situation as well. So thank you again, uh, uh, to Ms. Ramirez, for sharing your knowledge and experience. 
Uh, for better understanding, uh, many industry practitioners are saying it is perfect time to re-explore our guest behavior and customers' expectation on our industry, especially the hospitality industry. And it is more than important to understand how we as a guest or, uh, or customers behave once and need at the hotels and how hotel companies are actually dealing with these specific needs and wants of the customers, especially uh, the amid the COVID-19 pandemic. So I will invite Dr. Agnes DeFranco, who is the professor of the Hilton College, to discuss about uh, this issue and also how comp hotel companies are actively employing the technology to deal with uh, such uh, specific needs and wants of the guests. Hello, Dr. DeFranco. Hello. Uh, the, yes, the first question is, actually guest expectation and concerns were changed after the COVID-19, as we all know. Now the one priority is safety. And for this priority, hotel firms are actively employing different types of technologies to boost up the sales and try to uh, the, promote the, uh, the demands from the market. What technologies are hotel companies currently using to do so? And how can especially the social distancing or social measures for uh, the preventive philosophy be dealt by the hospitality industry using such technologies nowadays? Okay, so if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen because I want to show you a lot of pictures so we can see what's going on. So let's try this, see if that will work. Can you all see the screen? Yes, okay, so let me grab this away and start from here. Okay, so absolutely technology. Um, one thing that we know is that we need to deploy current technology first that we have. So we all have a cell phone. So many restaurants are using QR codes already to have the menu displays for the guests to order. And there are also hospitality and technology companies that put together apps that can be used for hotels and other food services. And these systems will let the guests self order and even pay for the food in the guest room via their own phone. They can also use that in the restaurant as well. But this contactless solution will help hoteliers to drive the F&B revenues while maintaining, um, Dr. Kim, you mentioned social distancing that we talked about earlier. Then of course is the payment end. We all need to get paid, right? So there are many forms of digital payments. And obviously the touch-free options such as tapping your card would be the best. And if an establishment can program the POS the bill can actually show a QR code. So the guests will only have to scan the code on the phone and the bill is processed. So the app is especially good if it is a hotel and restaurants with a specific app, because then that hotel or restaurant can also include other information such as special offers or loyalty points included in that. Now in hotels, we have used cell phones um, quite a bit already and we have used the apps to go check in, check out rooms, choose our rooms and all that. But these technology can also give you a lot of information too. And Dr. Bowen can also tell us a lot more about this too, because it's marketing as well. And we can collect guest preferences, passport information and so on. And of course that cell phone is now going to be also your key to your hotel room. And there are hotels such as uh, Citizen M that developed their own app for the guests to use their cell phones again to become the one and only remote to control everything in that room. So you don't even need to touch the light fixture to turn the light on or to have another remote for your TV. All you need is that app and that app can even order food for you and all that. Now the one that I love the most is this one. Is as a guest, you can use your phone to reserve your seating reservation by the pool or by the beach. This app utilizes customized property information and seating maps and organize the logistics of social distancing, as we said earlier, among the registered guests when they enjoy the pool and beaches. And yes, you can order drinks with that app as well. Um, digital display is another current technology that's there already. And in Manhattan, the Renaissance New York Midtown has this big screen that as soon as you walk in, you can start seeing all these technology. And of course, robots. And by the way, Dr. Bowen has a great research paper on robots already. And the use of robots is just going to accelerate because of the issue of contact. And robots can deliver food, deliver towels and other items. And many of them can be easily reconfigured to meet the needs of the hotel. 
And we even have this tug robot that can tug a luggage cart. So the card will arrive at your door and you will receive a code, which is a message or a text on your cell phone. You use that code to open the door and you get your own luggage back. And by the way, this has been in place since 2018. So in case you miss your good old remote, there's the low tech single use sleep guard so that you can be assured of the cleanliness. And by the way, in Rhode Island, the Ocean House has totally reimagined and personalized their cocktail hour that from every day, 5 to 7 p.m., they use this bold red cocktail card that rolls door to door to each guest room. And they offer you canapes, complimentary, of course. And at the same time, you can choose champagne or cocktails that can be mixed on the spot. So there are lots of things going on, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you so much for sharing uh, kind of the great technologies that hotel companies are actively using currently. And I didn't realize that hotel companies are using so many different types of technologies nowadays. But I just read an article regarding the new technology in restaurant industry, which used the hologram uh, menu so that people doesn't have to, uh, to deal with the physical menu. Uh, in, instead of it, they can use the hologram so that they don't have to make any physical touch or physical encounters. Then what do you see for the future based on the technology? There would be more new technologies out there. And are there any new technologies coming into the market and coming into the hotel industry in the near future? Um, yes, there are a few. And actually either it's technology or just repurposing different things and so on. So years back, and Dr. Sorsak can help me with that, the word antibacterial, everything is antibacterial. So now everything is antimicrobial. So you now have antimicrobial room key cards, or, you know, so, so you can use that and not have to worry about the bacteria. And in case some of us are leery about touching all those kiosks and all that, well, no worries there either, because now we have antimicrobial paint and screen protectors for your kiosks. And if that's not enough, if you go to a meeting, we also have antimicrobial lanyard for your meetings. Now, um, Ms. Ramirez said earlier that when you have parties and all that, so how can we celebrate? Well, Hyatt is offering this hybrid wedding experiences already. So it's how we can use current technology and change it to be a little bit newer than we used to use it for. And for those of you who miss um, just sitting in your room and go, what am I gonna do and all that? Well, Hyatt also has this mixology class online which you can participate using your TV in your room and you can just order the mixology kit. They will deliver to you so you can be watching a TV in your hotel room and mixing the drinks as well. So for those of you who miss going to the movies, by the way, this is the Houstonian Hotel in town. And they come up with a way to allow for proper distancing with rom a romantic dinner and a movie date night series. And they converted that 400 ballroom into a theater for 26 couples with two seat tables appropriately spread out. But um, Dr. Kim, you mentioned something about new technology. Well, technology is great, but they obviously are not cheap. So this one that you see on the right hand side, the shoe sanitizing station, that's being used in a number of restaurants in Florida. That costs you $25,000. And one restaurant invested $7,000 in the UV-like devices, specifically in the sanitizing instruments, and they actually outfit the whole UVC system um, inside the restaurant air conditioning um, system as well. So that is $7,000. Um, we talked about plastic shields earlier. This is a plastic shields and a filtration system. And you guys may remember uh, Mr. Ala Duquesne, who is also an inductee of our Hall of Honor. He's a, of a, obviously a famous French chef. He spent 50,000 euros to install the system in his restaurant. And notice the filters up on the ceiling right here. And also the plexiglass in between the tables and so on. So some restaurants also use this thermal imaging to quickly screen whether a person has um, the temperature or not. Now, remember most hotels, we have camera system already. And there's a technology that they can enhance those cameras. You don't have to reinstall it. You just need to install that new system software in it and use these cameras to become a thermal imaging device to see if somebody has a fever. But these that you see over here, these freestanding ones cost you about three to $5,000. And by the way, the Magnolia Bakery in New York, 
they have chosen to install three products. This is the first one called the Cleanse Portal, which is a freestanding walkthrough arch that uses a human safe UVC light to inactivate bacteria and viruses on your skin. And they need 20 seconds and they give you the right dosage and you'll be good. And by the way, for those of you who are ice hockey fans, you may recognize Lars Ellers here from the Washington Capitals. He donated the Clans Portal to the DC Central Union Mission. So Magnolia Bakery is also installing this Clans Downlight. And it's also the same using the same technology, but it's a light now that um, is put on the ceiling, of course, and then incorporates the same technology to inactivate those bacteria and viruses in the air and also services that are exposed to this light. And the third technology that Magnolia Baker is putting in is the Cleanse Air Sanitizing Truffer. Now this one circulates the air through a HEPA carbon filter and exposes that air to UVA and UVC light. And it's capable supposedly to kill and eliminate 99.99% of airborne pathogens in seconds. So of course, if you want a bigger system, no problem, they just cost a little bit more. Now, as early as March, the Western Houston Medical Center Hotel was the first hotel that announced that they would use these robots to clean the room. And that's what Ms. Rares was talking about earlier. And Hilton is also using this in its Beverly Hills hotels. And for cleaning smaller places or spaces, um, and something that's a bit more economical is those electrostatic sprayers. The gun in the middle costs you $700 or so. The system on the right in green color, that's about $1,800. And the one on the left is $2,300. And just in case you have outdoor events, and as Dr. Surset said, wash your hands. So this system can be something that's like a Cambro unit right here and plug in something like this, it costs you $300 or something like this for $1,250. Uh, $1, and to answer one more time your question, Dr. Kim, of new um, technology, this one over here, I thought it was pretty interesting. This is um, a prototype at MGM. You see that they're putting this plexiglass right between the two um, machines, and you see this wand coming down. And what it does is that every so often it's programmed to come down, and then it will sanitize the plexiglass inside and out so that so nobody needs to be disturbing the guests who will be playing. Um, you see a person sitting right here. Um, so we don't have to disturb him. And the one will just go back when everything is done. So um, these are what we're seeing right now um, as far as the technology that are available. Thank you so much for sharing so diverse types of technologies that are currently using or, or that are likely to be using in the, future, in the near future. Uh, many technologies looks really uh, helpful and also some are really cheap to adapt for uh, mm -hmm. by companies and especially the restaurant industry, not like hotel industry, many uh, small or medium sized restaurant companies are actually uh, suffering from uh, the financial predicaments. So it is really important for us to discuss a little bit more about the restaurant industry and their reactions. So I would like to invite Dr. Nathan Jarvis who is the assistant professor of Hilton College in San Antonio campus, and will discuss more about the restaurant industry. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Kim, for having me. Um, go ahead. Yes, it's my honor, yes. Uh, yes, as we've discussed, restaurant industry is the industry that uh, actually got the hardest hit out of all industry in the United States economy. So could you share a little bit about the status of the industry nowadays and uh, how far restaurant can be sustainable and profitable based on the current uh, capacity management strategy? Well, uh, those are uh, big questions. Uh, the first one uh, really depends on what segment you're looking at. Uh, you know, when most states closed operations uh, in March or April, um, all segments suffered for the most part. Uh, but as we have moved on, uh, some segments have thrived and uh, others have uh, kind of lagged behind. Great examples of those that have uh, done particularly well would be, you know, the Sonics of the world and the pizza delivery operations, uh, particularly those that have used technology or were using technology and uh, were quick to leverage it, uh, have really done 
pretty well uh, and have uh, recovered uh, many of the losses they had early on. Uh, we also see similar things in the fast food segment. Um, we'll talk a little bit about sustainability here. Uh, you know, the fast food industry, uh, some of the chains even have uh, positive numbers year over year right now, uh, which is pretty amazing to think about uh, that their sales are up over last year. I would say the majority of, of those are all pushing through drive-through uh, or delivery service, um, which is, is interesting. Uh, a few of them have reopened dining rooms. Uh, and while they've opened dining rooms, uh, still most of their volume is going through the drive-through or, or delivery. Uh, we even had uh, early this week, KFC deciding to close all of their um, corporate dining rooms to go back to just drive through. Uh, what they're finding is uh, labor is lower because they don't have to sanitize and manage the dining room and they can just push volume through the drive through. Regarding you know, your question about sustainability, I think the primary concern people have right now is how do I operate when I have a reduced capacity at 25% or 50% you know, capacity. And uh, the answer is it really depends on the segment. Uh, we've two, two things to kind of keep on mind. Uh, you know, Texas was at 75% capacity for a short bit. Uh, and now we're, we're back at 50. From a practical standpoint, there's no difference between 50% and 75% capacity, right? If you're trying to socially distance tables and with six feet in between them, you can't put more than 50% of the tables in there um, and, and do so in a safe way. So uh, once you get to 50%, the next bump up is 100% capacity. Uh, so it's just important to, to keep that in mind. Um, one way to get around this, not get around this, one way to uh, try to uh, help um, in this uh, area is that a number of operators are trying to use uh, their outdoors. Uh, whether that's to be their patios or other spaces. Uh, currently in Texas, most outdoor uh, patios and, and tables don't get counted for the capacity uh, calculations, um, which means that you could have 50% of your people inside. So let's say you're rated for 200 in your dining room, you have 100 people inside, and then you still could have, you know, another 70 people on the patio. Uh, provided that they're socially distanced um, between the tables. So uh, that's one way that operators have tried to increase their capacity right now. And I believe that uh, some operators are even getting, uh, I guess what would be called a waiver from TABC uh, or municipalities to be able to extend their patio onto sidewalks and into parking lots to be able to serve people kind of outside the normal bounds of, you know, where they are. So uh, beyond that, uh, I've had people ask about, well, what happens if I'm going to open my dining room? Uh, you know, one thing to keep in mind is people are not going to uh, start coming in waves, you know, in huge amounts like it might be with a, a grand opening. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's going to be a trickle. I've talked to operators where they open their dining room at 25 or 50 percent capacity and they see one table during the whole shift, uh, you know, and so you have to expect that it's going to be small um, and hopefully will grow uh, depending on how well you can connect with your consumers and, you know, ensure them that you're trying to uh, keep both your employees and uh, them safe. Ultimately, what you're looking at is you're looking at two categories of restaurants. You're looking at those that have stayed closed this entire time and haven't done any type of delivery or to-go service. Uh, many of those operators are struggling or would struggle to open up their dining room at limited capacity because, you know, having one table for a shift just can't cover everyone that you need uh, to open your restaurant. But the other group uh, of uh, restaurants, the ones that have been doing delivery, the ones that have been doing uh, to-go and curbside, et cetera, a lot of them are finding that they can successfully open up uh, at 25 or 50% capacity because the incremental cost of bringing in a server to manage the, the dining room is low enough uh, that they can, they can do that. And sometimes it even makes them, um, uh, makes their PL look even better. So uh, there are opportunities there. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 
based on the NRA's report, uh, the eating and, and, and dining, uh, the sales records actually uh, the increase for last two consecutive months from the April, so that they are currently uh, slowly, but currently uh, kind of revitalized uh, by uh, kind of increased demand in the market. But also many people are still concerning about the safety and health issues in regards to the dining out options. What would be your uh, kind of the, the, uh, the predictions in regards to the restaurant industry after the COVID-19 and what are the prospects of sustainability of the FMB industries after the COVID-19 pandemic? So uh, I think it's a given that the industry is, is going to contract significantly. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of losses, um, you know, whether that's everything from, um, you know, franchises that close, defaults on loans, uh, operations that never reopen. I think the last estimate I saw for San Antonio was, conservatively 550 restaurants will never reopen here over 500 of those are independents that employ less than 25 people right so the the independent operator the small operator is, is suffering the most in most cases we are going to come back the food and beverage industry is not going anywhere um i think what you will see with regards to changes uh limited menus or reduced menus are not going away uh, i think we'll see operators that have gone on limited menu right now that will never go back to a full menu. Um, I also, on the plus side, even though it's it's sad to talk about the people that won't survive, the operations that won't survive, the closings of those restaurants uh, are going to present opportunities um, of pent up demand once we get post COVID. Uh, so the operations right now or, or the investors right now that have cash on hand and are willing to wait um, and, and be smart about it will have an opportunity to either buy up concepts or open concepts to meet that demand once we get we get past COVID. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Jarvis, for your very practical standpoint toward the COVID-19 and the situation after it. So, uh, yeah, I will be with restaurant industry and I really would like to dine out freely, in short. Uh, as we discussed, hotel and restaurant industries are working hard to overcome this, uh, this devastating pandemic situations. What are prospects of service industry as a whole in the future? Dr. Bowen will deliver key issues with the resilience of the service industry. Thank you, Dr. Bowen, for being here with us. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Uh, first, can you briefly describe current service industry situation and the expected changes uh, and the, the use of the technology during or after the pandemic situation? Well, I, I think Dr. DeFranco did an excellent job of uh, talking about the uh, current technology. Uh, might just add on to that from a marketing standpoint. Um, there's been a lot of uh, progress in using uh, big data analytics, uh, AI, uh, machine learning, uh, which has enabled us to learn a lot about our customers. I mean, uh, scraping the internet so we know what restaurants you went out to eat at in the last couple of months, uh, what wines you like, um, how many people are in your family, what your kids do. I mean, there's so much information, it becomes creepy um, that we have to be careful in how we use it or, or else really, we, and it's, I've seen it happen in hotels, for example, in Las Vegas. One hotel found out that a uh, person coming to a business meeting there was gonna miss their son's soccer game. So uh, in their room, they put a digital photo of their son which they gotten off the internet uh so when he walked in the first time he'd been in the hotel never been in there before he sees a digital photo of his son on the the, the dresser and, and so things like that can be a little bit creepy so but we were getting a lot of information in those hotels that used it properly could do a lot with that i'm, I'm an advisor on a group called kyc hospitality um, and we were going pretty strong in the US before the pandemic. And then when it hit, they shifted all their emphasis over to Asia where the things are starting to go pretty strong. So I, I think it's been said and what Arlene mentioned too is hotels are in a survival mode. So we've seen um, 
the expansion in technology, particularly the more expensive technology and software uh, that had an upfront cost, that's slowing down. Um, in terms of technology that's here and, and has helped is we've had some self-service technology. So certainly the digital keys in hotels, the uh, kiosk at McDonald's, which have really been handy during the pandemic because it's uh, eliminated a lot of the person-to-person -person contact with this type of technology. And, and I think that the, um, uh, what Arlene and uh, Agnes did with our students, and now it's posted on the, the college's website with the, uh, how you can make in a few minutes digital menus, because I go into restaurants and I see them giving fairly fancy menus to each guest, which are paper and are going to be destroyed later on, and think that um, with all the other costs we mentioned, they have to go through. Um, anything that can cut down on the costs uh, like this is, is going to help them. The other thing I think is, again, looking at simpler technology is websites, because a lot of Hotels, or and particularly restaurants, have changed their hours, maybe even the days they're open. Um, and if that's not updated on the website or on their Facebook page, um, it can cause a lot of confusion. Also, as Nathan mentioned, I think you know one of the things hotels have done is gone to limited menus too. So again, getting that information out, I think, is important as well. And then hopefully, once this passes, we'll see again the resurgence in uh, the use of AI and robotics and uh, robotics and other means uh, in, in the industry. Thank you, Dr. Bowen. Uh, due to the fact that many companies are actively using the technology, uh, they are currently uh, kind of responding very uh, proactively to the situations. And also most of the behaviors that companies are making is to meet the needs and wants of the customers in the market. So I would like to tie the, uh, the prepared two questions into one. So uh, many technologies are actually uh, the heading to the customer's needs and wants, and many companies are using technologies or different types of analysis to meet that needs and wants in the market to make uh, kind of a better uh, financial or business performance. As a marketing guru in hospitality industry, how could you uh, foresee the, mar uh, the future marketing strategy and how could you project the situation after the pandemic in a service industry as a whole? Well, I think, and, and again, to tie on what, what Nathan said, I think there are gonna be some consumer behavior changes that will be around for a while. Um, you know, there was one study that said that 54% of the people um, feel anxious and actually are trying to avoid going into a restaurant, albeit they will um, pick up food and, and take it home, but they don't want to go in to, to, to the restaurant. So I think that's going to be a change. So I think we're going to see, and I think uh, Nathan spoke to this as well, a change in delivery systems. And one of the things is I think we know is that third party delivery systems can be very expensive. Um, so people have gotten used to what's called curbside pickup, where they come and they pick it up uh, outside the restaurant. So if we can develop better ways of doing that, better ways of delivering that and continuing that on, that's a way we can uh, serve the customer who wants to take that food home and eat it, um, and then also um, cut out the expensive uh, the delivery costs of, of using a third party. And again, as Nathan mentioned, one of the things we've seen is a lot of people have gotten smart and developed specific takeout menus because it's, um, it's a whole different production system. It's almost like going back into a factory and setting up lines and filling the takeout dishes and so on. And so thinking about how we can prepare foods that are optimized for taking out a hold well where we don't need a zillion containers. I went to one Mexican restaurant and I came out with a two huge bags because each little sauce they put in a different container, the rice they put in a different container. And, and, and I thought when I got home, this cost them a ton of money, plus time to do it. So, so reconceptualizing how in you know, our takeout systems, and I think this will be around for a while afterwards as people gradually get used to uh, coming back into to restaurants. I think one of the things too on the hotel side from a consumer is Tying in with what 
Arlene was talking about is thinking about why would a person want to come to our hotel? Now, if you're next to a beach or you're next to a popular outdoor park or things like that, that gives you a reason and there's a natural constituency that will come there. So what are the reasons people would want to come? Are there neat restaurants around us that are open that people could come stay at the restaurants or stay at the hotel and sample the restaurant? And, and again, obviously bars uh, in Texas have closed up again, although it, in other jurisdictions there or other states, I should say, they're still open. So you could get into the brew pubs and things like that, breweries that people might want to uh, go on a tour on. But, but why would they want to come? And then once you answer that question, who would be attracted to that type of tran transaction to, to, to go out and uh, go after those customers? And so those are some of the key things. I think going on, I think one of the lessons that we've learned is I've gone to restaurants that uh, you, you can't get a seat at. Um, again, again, they're 50% full. They've gone to outside seating, but they were popular and they did a great job and people appreciated them. And so when they have a chance to go back, they want to go back. Yet there will be somebody down the road that will have that one seat or two seats all night. So I think it, it reinforces that once we get through this is, is how are you going to be better than the competition? What are you going to do to get customers coming in so that restaurants that might have been satisfied making enough to pay the bills and so on um, versus the ones that really had a strong customer base. Those are the ones that are uh, going to make it. The other thing with distribution system, again, as we just mentioned outside seating, a lot of people feel a lot more comfortable sitting outside where there's a breeze and things going on. So we've seen that as a way to encourage people to come in during the pandemic. And I've seen some restaurants get creative with this. There was one restaurant where about two blocks away, there was a, a guest hotel, small hotel, boutique hotel, but it had a nice yard going up to it. Um, and they worked an arrangement with the hotel where they could put up a tenant seating on the hotel's grounds because they didn't have any. Um, and so that way they were able to expand their seating outside. Um, they set up a service bar there, but again, being creative, they realized that walking food two, two blocks up, even if you have covers on it, uh, it, isn't the most optimal thing. So they set up and they served the food as if it was takeout. So they put it in takeout containers, took it out, served it up there. Um, and then, um, there was a bar up there so you could get your drinks and everything served as, as normal. So, so being creative and thinking about, again, what people want and then uh, how can we uh, give that to them. And then the other, uh, you know, for marketing, we talk about the internal customer. I think the other thing to think about is how are we going to protect our internal customers? Because a lot of people, when they get into a restaurant, they're drinking, they're happy, um, they don't have masks on but all the servers are, are there. So, uh, you know, the social distancing, of course, uh, and, and another thing that I thought was clever, I saw in a restaurant, is they took a side tray and set it on the corner of the uh, table and said, um, your, the, the host said, your, your food server will be placing your food there, uh, and then you can pick it up from there to bring it to you. And, and then when you're through with your plates, you, you can put it back on the uh, tray um, and they'll be picked up. But I thought that showed respect for, for the people who were working in the restaurants. And I think one of the things we learned and Arlene talked about a little bit about employees is that you need to rethink, I think, some of the things that, that for our employees and the benefits we're providing them. Because, you know, one of the things that came out early on was a lot of restaurants don't provide sick leave for employees. Um, and a lot of these employees are lower paid, and so they need to pay their bills, they need to get paid. And so, you know, people were coming to work sick. Um, sometimes there were cases where people were even encouraged by their boss because they needed bodies to come into work when they called in sick. So I think we need to rethink some of the employee benefits we provide that, that have come out as a result of this uh, as well. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Bowen. Uh, Dr. Bowen, just uh, to recapitulate every single thing that we've learned before from the beginning of consumer behavior and marketing and to the end of uh, human resource management and strategic management. Once again, thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights toward the, uh, the service industry. Uh, as uh, we all agree, our, universe, our college, Hilton College, is working really closely uh, with the industry personnel and our alumni is strongly supporting our colleges. So uh, we cannot uh, kind of detach education and practical uh, the industry situation uh, into part. So in this moment, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Mary Dawson, who is the Associate Dean of the Hilton College, to discuss about the education in hospitality uh, area. Uh, hello, Dr. Dawson. Hello, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for waiting for long. And uh, I hope uh, the last but not the least, you will be discussing a lot about the hospitality education and its role for uh, the future industry. So first, uh, could you briefly explain the impacts of coronavirus and COVID-19 pandemic on hospitality education in regards to uh, any of uh, the format changes or course updates uh, to the career path of this, uh, the current or potential uh, master or PhD students of our college? Sure, so I'll answer that kind of two part. One is, it is within our college specifically, and I've had a, a number of alumni ask me out of curiosity, what are the, what are the format for us? So for us, um, typically we were in the past only teaching about 25% or less of our classes online, and that's completely shifted. This coming fall, we have about a fourth of our classes that are meeting face to face. But rather than being called face to face, they're now this new term called high flex. And what that means is there'll be instructors actually in the classroom um, with students. And if you'll believe it or not, the max capacity we could have in a room like S104 that uh, that Arlene has behind her, her right now, um, that normally sits 150 with social distancing, the max we can have in that room is 34 students. So it gives you a perspective of how small the classes will be. Um, and then with that, while someone's teaching face-to-face, -face, the students will also be able to log in and watch that class synchronously and participate that way. Then we also have a format where students log in at a prescribed time, they sign up for the course, and they'll be watching it just like you're watching right now via Zoom. They log on and they interact with the instructor that way. And then the last was just asynchronously, it's just a typical online class in the format that we were teaching before. So a little bit of that is we were, we were fortunate at our college that a majority of our faculty had taught online before. Nobody had taught synchronously until last, last March, um, but they're getting very good at it and, and spending a lot of time this summer getting ready for that and being prepared. So it's, I think for all of us, it's new because we're really having to learn how do we engage students, which I wanna emphasize on that because I noticed um, a question in the, in the box, the chat box was asking, how do you engage students? So we're gonna have some challenges this fall, especially for freshmen who haven't been to campus. How do we keep them engaged and learn how to be part of the Hilton College culture, right? And so we're being really creative this summer and coming up with some activities that we can do virtually. <laughs> um, and also, um, and then the other part of that is how do we do career fair? So right now, a challenge we have with career fair is a lot of the recruiters were furloughed. So we don't even have communications with some of those companies. Um, other companies who have recruiters have told us they don't have a travel budget. So this fall, our career fair is gonna be completely virtual. So in a way, that's a good thing for our students because they're, they actually, there's a number of students now involved with planning career fair that are learning that skill. They're learning how to plan a virtual conference and taking that, you know, that new learning outcome. So that's part of it. Um, the second part of your question, you were asking me about, um, what should masters or PhD students consider? I think keep in mind, um, if you haven't pursued a, an advanced degree, now's a great time to do that. Maybe you have downtime at home <laughs> that you didn't have before, or unfortunately, if your hours have been cut back at work and maybe you have more time, take that investment in yourself right now. 
keep yourself occupied with that. Uh, there's a lot changing with our industry that would be great to research right now. Also, or learn more about and being engaged with other people while you're at home and you take classes synchronously. Um, you know, I highly recommend that. Thank you so much for your valuable tips for those who are currently uh, pursuing the master or PhD programs in our college or in others as well. Uh, I, I got the news uh, regarding the education system of the United States a few days ago that uh, many uh, elementary schools, middle school, and universities are considering the online and high flex teaching method instead of the classic form of on-site teaching. Uh, of course, it'll be very uh, temporal kind of policy and method for securing the personal uh, safety and uh, health issues. However, uh, it is really important time for us to think about the future as well in education area. So Dr. Dawson, uh, could you foresee any future changes in hospitality education? And also, could you recommend any other tips for those who are thinking of the uh, kind of the future uh, personal development uh, through the education systems like Hilton College? Sure. So part of that, you know, a reality that even prior to COVID, we were starting to see enrollment go down in hospitality programs, uh, you know, across the U.S. already. So that we were already ramping up and looking at ways that we could adapt to that. Um, and one of the things, and I've had, you know, in right now for our fall enrollment, it is slightly down with COVID. Um, the, the nice part about that is, is when we reach out to students who've been admitted, um, their response is, I want to go to a community college right now, but once I, just so that I can stay home and get my basics, but once I, you know, feel comfortable coming to campus, I want to be at the Hilton College. So I'm excited that we haven't necessarily lost students. They may just be start delaying or maybe they take a, a gap year, a gap semester right now. Um, but with that, I, I, you know, I've had a concern myself is how do we attract people to our major when you're seeing so many restaurants and hotels suffering right now? And I think the key is, is, is really making the case, and this is true for a lot of you I noticed on this call who've graduated from our program and are teaching yourself, is we are not just limited to hotels and restaurants. And we really need to show that a degree in hospitality, it's, the skills are transferable to many industries, and as well as promoting the fact that our major isn't just hotels and restaurants. For instance, um, if you're not aware, within our own curriculum starting last fall, we launched two new tracks. So we still have a traditional lodging track and we have a traditional food service track, but we also have a dedicated uh, emphasis on wine and beverage studies that's more in depth than we had before. And then we have a new track that's on project management and analytics. So that skill set alone um, can really open the door to new career paths that we haven't been able to do in the past. And we're, we're currently the only hospitality co college that's offering that at an undergraduate level. So it's unique to our college, you know, unique for us and hopefully we'll attract people in that. The other part and you were, you were asking me then, uh, you know, what, what can we do? I think now is a great time to start reaching out and looking, be, looking who we can invite to be and come engaged with the college potential new guest speakers. For those of you that already are in PhD programs and maybe you're worried, you know, what, what's it look like for me to go out and look for a job, you know, teaching someplace right now? You know, I think reach out, be a guest speaker, make that contact now. You can also, um, you know, keep, you know, this is a good time to foster your research skills more, but then at the same time, um, you know, if there are positions to be an instructor someplace, take those. Even if it's an adjunct professor, take those, those opportunities. Uh, within, if you graduated from our undergraduate program, and maybe, you know, we have multiple master's programs now that you can take completely online, our executive master's program, as well as we've expanded the offerings with our face-to-face uh, -face program. Um, we have an, a large number of our undergraduate students who are staying on an additional year and completing a master's now as well. 
Thank you so much for uh, kind of informing all of us about kind of new changes that our college is currently making and uh, will be uh, employed to our college in the near future. Uh, so it is really good to uh, think about uh, having another personal kind of investment to ourselves to develop uh, further for kind of the future opportunities that we can uh, exploit in the future. Uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledges from the, uh, from the scientific standpoint to the end of practical standpoint and education standpoint. And from now on, I heard we have so many questions out there. So I would like to get uh, kind of questions from our, uh, the audience. And now we have Alec Zorik, um, graduating class of uh, graduate class of 2019, and he'll be asking a question. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alec. It's good to see you all again. Uh, I'm a current law student, so actually this has more to do with legal standpoints. Uh, with legislation introduced in Congress to stop potential lawsuits against businesses, uh, what liability concerns do you expect to see for business owners as well as frontline employees affecting the industry moving forward? I will take a stab at that since no one raised their hand right away. <laughs> um, that, that's a really good question. And I don't think right now we've seen a whole lot of litigation around it. I do think that the precautions and the concerns that hotels and restaurants, I can only speak to hotels really, um, as far as making sure that their employees are safe. You know, there's a lot of things and, and the employees, in some places the employees are being told, you know, that there is a risk involved, but there are coverages, I guess, with workers comp to a certain degree. I think a lot of that is still very much unchartered territory. I think right now people are just trying to, um, as Dr. Bowen put it, uh, survival mode, right? We just wanna move forward. I, I think there's probably big exposure, but I think we'll see more of it after we probably have more therapeutics and a vaccine. And then people are gonna go back and say, you know, I've seen it in other industries. I think we've seen it in retail, where retail employees have sued their workers, I mean, their employers for that. I haven't seen any real cases with hotels. Um, and it could be maybe just for the nature of our industry too. You know, we, we are thinking about who we're bringing in, how we're bringing people in, and we're trying to be very proactive with it. I know restaurants, and maybe um, Nathan can speak to this, restaurants, when someone does get tested and they come out positive, the restaurant ends up closing and cleaning everything and, and making everybody go in, into um, isolation you know, at home. So I think we may see some, but I'm not an attorney. You probably know more than I do, but I, I do see that there's probably some exposure. And that's something that as hotel club owners, restaurant owners, we really need to partner with our insurance brokers, the ones that carry the workers comp, the liability insurance, all of those, and really ask those questions. Does my policy have that? Is there anything new? Is there a trailer I can add to the policy that covers me for this so that it limits my exposure? So hopefully, again, I tried to answer, maybe didn't quite answer. <laughs> if anybody else has another uh, input on there. I think Arlene is totally correct. It's the insurance company. That's one thing that you may want to talk to them um, because they're, we're talking about is how you can prove to is how did I get that illness? How did I get COVID? How do we know that is my worker who's standing next to me the whole day and he has both COVID or, or she has COVID. So now I have COVID. So how do I prove that? Is that burden of proof that is difficult? So. But we'll see because it, this will be coming and it's a very good question, Alec. And just to touch on that, I, I would like to hear from Dr. Um, Tirata about all this sanitation that we're doing. Are we opening up ourselves to having 
more illnesses because we're so super clean? Is that a possibility? <laughs> um, yeah, I get asked this question, um, you know, typically in, in the food safety and sanitation class a lot. Um, so when we talk about disinfectants, especially, so disinfectants are different from sanitizers, right? So typically in restaurants, you clean and you sanitize. Um, the idea behind sanitation is to reduce the level of, you know, bacteria, viruses, uh, anything that can contaminate food. Disinfection is, um, you know, it's disinfecting surfaces. So you are basically using uh, some sort of either chemical or UV radiation to destroy uh, the surfaces of bacteria viruses in some capacity. And this is not just destroying the bad bacteria, viruses, pathogens, but also pretty much everything that's, that's around us. Um, so that's, that's a really good question. Uh, one thing that uh, sort of uh, does um, come across to me when I, when, I, when I see these technologies is it better be doing a good job of destroying everything because anything that survives, um, it's the, it's the um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, it, it creates a lot of resistance mechanisms in these uh, pathogens. I can go on and on, so I'm going to stop right there because um, I know there's a lot of questions uh, that are waiting for us. But that, that's, that's a really good point. I think it's certainly something that we should be um, thinking about uh, in terms of doing, you know, in a measured way. Uh, one thing that I do see is a lot of these new technologies coming out that have not been certified. So we need to be, um, you know, careful about what is used in food service and in, um, you know, hotels um, in terms of have they been vetted? Has, have these technologies been vetted and are they actually effective um, at doing the job that they claim to be doing? Well, that pretty much answers that then. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you all doing this. Next, uh, we have Greg Sowell, class of 1995. Hi, well, good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so for those of us in the culinary or hospitality uh, education, beyond the move to online distance learning, with the changes that are happening in the industry, how do you think that's going to change the face of culinary or hospitality education or how we, uh, what we teach or how we teach the student? I think that we're going to be offering more online classes than we were before. Um, we're really going to have to look at remote learning and, and that, and that's for a culinary course. Um, that's been challenging for us <laughs> um, because how do we get them engaged with that and, and looking at the cost for the student to purchase the food at home versus even at a lab fee when we can buy it in bulk. So that, that's something can, to consider. One thing that um, as far as curriculum though, we're already looking at is in the spring semester developing a course on crisis management and like response to um, pandemics and things that we can foresee in the future beyond just this. And luckily Dr. Searsat's gonna teach that and um, that we've already been talking about that. So we're gonna, we really need to, to look at embedding a lot of this in the curriculum in all of our classes. But then in addition, something very focused and concentrate, concentrated as well as for graduate students really fostering research in this area. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate the insight. Good to see everyone. You too, thank you. Next we have Miguel, class of 2009. Hello, Miguel, is still there? Here we go. Thanks for the serve, by the way. Uh, happy 50th birthday to Hilton College. Hi, Arlene. Hi, Nathan. 
So anyway, uh, so uh, my, my question is really around uh, if, if we take into account what Dr. Bowen said, and I'm going to refer to as the creepiness effect, um, how are we addressing possible security or privacy concerns with advances in technology? Thank you all. Well, there are rules. So there isn't, this isn't a free for all. It's not all of a sudden we can start putting cameras in the hotel room and see what you're doing and take your temperature. Um, there are definite rules as far as what we can do from a technology standpoint. So I would probably say going back to that legal question that because people are focused on so many different things that maybe right now there's probably a little window where some things are happening that maybe shouldn't. Um, but overall there is, for example, uh, GDPR, which is with um, the EU and us, where we have to protect the privacy and data of individuals. And if we don't do that, the fines are horrific. And with all the costs we're incurring right now, just in the hotel side, to, to not follow those rules would just be, you know, let's just put another nail on the coffin because you might as well just hand over the keys and say, you go take care of the hotel. So I think we're being very careful that we're following the rules that are already set in there. But I think uh, Dr. Uh, Sursat mentioned that some of these technologies, aside from being creepy, we need to make sure that they do what they say they're going to do. So if we say that we are putting in a machine that's going to zap everything in the room, um, that, it, that it better zap everything because if it doesn't, um, then we're gonna be in trouble. Um, I, I think from that part, yes. Now, the, the stuff that Dr. Bowen mentioned as far as collecting of the data, that's also covered by the GDPR. We, we can't really just go crazy. And that was pretty creepy. And, and that person could potentially, if they didn't allow that person to get that information, that hotel, and maybe Dr. Bowen can speak to that, what happened to that hotel? Yeah. yeah. So, so we can't put cameras in hotel rooms? <laughs> um, no, it, it, again, as Arlene mentioned, there, there are laws and there are certain private sites, which even if you could get, and I'm sure people can get into them, you can't uh, use that information. So it would be uh, using information that's uh, publicly available sources. I mean, I think one of the things that comes up too is, you know, what information you have out there that is publicly available that you might not want publicly available too. I think on the other hand, side two is the information you can get legally again you have to use it um, in a way that's uh, not going to hurt the other person too because again i remember uh talking with the owner or, or not owner but a general manager of a hotel in las vegas and so um you might not want to tell that person did you want the same even do you want the same wine that you had last week when you were here because they might be here now with their spouse um, and last week they weren't here with their spouse. So, 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 so again, even though you have all this information and the information you can get legally, you have to be really careful how you use it. So, so again, you, you, if you knew somebody went out to eat at sushi restaurants and like that, you wouldn't necessarily tell them, we heard you like sushi restaurants, you might, tell them there are some great restaurants in the area. We, we, we have a great steakhouse and we have a, a great Italian restaurant and we have one of the best sushi restaurants in Las Vegas all within a block of here. So you can do things like that. Thank you very much. Next we have Chelsea Lawson. Hi everyone, now you can see me. Um, my name is Chelsea Lawson. So I'm currently a student right now at the Conrad and Hilton College graduating this December. And it's a pleasure to see everyone um, virtually. Um, and thank you again for your time today as well. So my first question was actually answered by Dr. Bowen just about sustainability of the different technology um, impacts in the hotels and restaurants. So I'll go, my, go to my second question. 
My second question has to do more on the side of hotel development um, and talking about owners during a time like this. So I'm curious to understand what changes have you seen when it's come to the development of hotels and casinos um, now with COVID-19 looking in the future? Um, and that could be just design changes, staffing changes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Thank you. As far as development, there's not a whole lot going on. <laughs> um, but I think if you were having an existing property, you're probably moving forward, especially if it's in a demand, next to a demand generator. I have seen a lot of hoteliers taking this time the key is, and I think Nathan mentioned this with restaurants, if you were smart and you have cash and you put cash away when things were good and you were planning a renovation, this is the ideal time to do a renovation because your hotel is not full. You're not going to have to displace customers because you don't have a whole lot of customers to displace. So this is a good time to renovate your hotel rooms. As far as design, it's really hard to tell because I don't know if the long-term effects of this have actually set in with people because we went and you know from being in class we went from building small rooms right um, and huge public spaces and now we're saying no we don't want you in the public space we want you in your room so <clears throat> what does that do so do you decide now as you renovate to tear down a wall and have less keys so the room's bigger um, and make your public space smaller i think it's too soon to be that reactive, but I think if you're building a new hotel, you might want to have that in mind and saying, okay, do I find a happy medium? Do I find a room that now isn't overly cluttered? Because that's another thing, we're taking a lot of stuff out of the room because we don't want you touching too many things. Uh, make the room where it's adequate for you to enjoy a meal because we were taking out tables from rooms because people were not eating room service. So do we do that? This is a great time also to refinance your existing property. So if you're in a good situation, the, the rates are really good, even for commercial. Uh, so, you know, this is a great time if you have the money and your asset is not in a bad situation. You're in a place where maybe you're not at the normal occupancy, but maybe you're in the 40s or 50s. This is a good time to look at that. And a lot of hotel owners are looking at that now as well, refinancing to put themselves in a better situation so that they can get to that break even faster and make a profit. But that's what I could tell you right now. Right now, development is probably not going anywhere really fast. Uh, but if it was something that was already in the pipeline, it's probably moving. And if you were thinking about it, you're probably not gonna get financed because right now the, the banks are not gonna take that type of risk. Thank you. Now I have Nat Wen asking a question. Nat, you're still there? Yes, I'm still here. Can you see me? Here we go. We can see your here picture. Here we go. I think we're still getting used to the technology. Nat, you're muted. Sorry, can, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Oh, great. <laughs> so my name is Nyat Nguyen and I'm a, a master's student. Uh, I'm graduating this December. Uh, I'm taking a class called sustainability and I heard Dr. Nathan also talk about sustainability uh, in Western. Um, I have a question about the hospitality industry. So in this recent year, we, uh, we have been trying to reduce the environmental uh, impact on um, apply a lot of procedures like we use uh, bath towers, uh, minimize guest room services, um, discontinued of use of the um, single use uh, bottles like sample conditioner, um, but with uh, good conditions. So it looks like that we need to spend a little bit more 
on those single use amenities like clothes, masks. Um, and we had to avoid using the public uh, beverage dispensers. So we are increasing the environmental footprints to keep the industry to survive. Uh, what are your thoughts about this? Thank you. I can't speak directly to uh, the uses in hotels, but I mean, as you mentioned, we see, or Dr. Bowen mentioned, we see the same thing in restaurants where takeout containers use has skyrocketed. Uh, I think for most people uh, in the short term, it's a matter of safety over sustainability. Uh, you know, and, and that's just probably where we are right now. Uh, thankfully, you know, in the past 24 months, there've been a number of, um, from a packaging standpoint, a number of uh, packaging technologies have come online that are more sustainable, um, that are available. But the reality is kind of like toilet paper, that when the demand uh, increased uh, significantly, that things went out of stock. And so people were using whatever they could. If we're stuck with this long term, uh, I think we'll see people investigate more sustainable packaging and, and options. Uh, but again, it comes back to, safety is going to trump sustainability, uh, at least in the uh, short term. Yeah, they're asking a bunch of questions. You want to watch it? I know. But they didn't cut it off. There we go. Um, yeah, and I, I just agree with that, what Nathan said too, is I think right now everybody's in again in that survival mode. Um, and you see a lot of things like everybody's going to plastic silver, or eat, even in what might be a sit down restaurant where they use silver before from a sanitation standpoint, they're, they're using um, disposables. Um, so, so I think once things get settled down, I know that a lot of hotels are looking at and chains made um, commitments to getting rid of the uh, amenities. Um, but now that's sort of backed off a little bit because people, again, don't want to use a common squeeze shampoo or, or soap thing in, in the uh, shower. So I think that um, we'll see things continue on because we need to get more sustainable, but I think it'll be after the pandemic's over before we get some big changes in this area. Thank you. Now I have Phil. All right, are y'all able to hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Are y'all able to hear me? I apologize. Yes. Okay, great, great. So, um, yeah. It's good to see y'all again. I, I definitely miss my uh, pre-class uh, and post-class conversations with y'all. So this is a, this definitely helps that itch just a little bit. Uh, but my question really has to do with uh, the next two, three weeks. Uh, we can see that a lot of uh, general managers and owners of restaurants have been mentioning that they're having issues with getting employees to come back because of the federal un unemployment that they're getting. And we know that the federal unemployment is going to be ending here within the next, I don't know, what, 10 days or something like that. So, uh, you know, with, I would assume that, you know, in August that all of these employees will be looking for jobs considering the fact that you know, they're not going to be getting $1,600 paychecks every two weeks. They're probably going to be bumped down to the state, which is, I think, $600. Um, so it's a little tough to live off $600 every two weeks. But with the restaurant still being at 50% capacity and bars still being closed, do we, are, will we be seeing some drastic changes as far as like maybe even the restaurants uh, backing out of doing these third party deliveries and maybe even creating an own, their own delivery system? Um, and even maybe for bars at some point, maybe seeing the government having to step in, provide some funds 
uh, so that they can, you know, stay open themselves. So. And Phil, you're, you're very correct. Restaurants have to be very nimble. And as Dr. Bowen said, they just have to come up with new ideas. And Dr. Jarvis mentioned that too. So when you're talking about delivery, for instance, um, actually in Austin, there is a group that they do their own delivery in the sense that there are a few um, restaurants that get together that come up with their own delivery, sort of collaborative and so on, um, that they just use an app and there will be a, an order coming in and these 10 people, whoever they are, that they are on this app together, they'll go, okay, I'll go and fill the order. So I'll come at your restaurant, pick it up and deliver. Now there are pros and cons obviously because they will be not, they won't be hired by the individual restaurants. So they are contractors. So they're still not the, um, the benefits that we talked about earlier. But at the same time, there's something for them to at least tide over. Now, um, Dr. Jarvis, Dr. Bowen mentioned a lot of different ideas too that restaurants have done. And Mr. Maris also talked about what hotels have done. During this time, we all just need to come up with ideas and to just change our industry, not to change it drastically, still have all the things that we want, you know, deal with our customers, serve our customers, but at the same time to sustain our industry um, until we can get out of, you know, this situation with the vaccine and all that. Um, so we just have to, you know, keep on being um, positive and come up with ideas. And that's why the, the Hilton, Hilton College come up with the hackathon idea as well, is to get, you know, people all around the world to come into this idea and share what they're doing and come up with just new ideas that maybe we can adopt and help the industry to just move on and be well. I, a couple of things. As, it, it is one is I think there will be uh, an additional payments of $400. It looks like it'll end up being $400 a week and either go through December or January. I, I know both the Congress and Senate are working on this. And I think something will come around. So they'll, th th there'll still be that money available. But I think that the point th th that you made is really important that a lot of people didn't want to come back to work in this industry when they could get their jobs. And I know uh, I have a friend who's a big restaurateur and Dallas and he, he was having trouble getting with pe people back. And I think, so that one of the things, you know, tying into what Agnes was talking about, we need to look at perhaps some structural changes and, and how do we pay people more so, so that our industry isn't sort of at the bottom of the barrel in terms of what people are making, but ways that we can improve productivity, we can hire good people, we can maintain good people, we can pay them good benefits um, and, and again, so that when something like this happens, people will want to come back to work rather than sit back and take their $600 a week. And I'll add to that, um, as Dr. Bowen and Dr. DeFranco said, uh, you know, creativity and, and being nimble is key here. You know, we, we just saw, I think it was last week, Danny Meyer in New York announced that their hospitality included program that uh, basically excluded tipping was being done away with in all their operations uh, because they found it wasn't really compensating their people, particularly in this environment. And they're going to a tip structure uh, or they're going back to a tip structure. So I, we'll see people try lots of different things regarding third party or delivery period. Uh, you're absolutely right. I think we'll see people shift from third party delivers to some sort of in-house or collaborative uh, delivery. I think it was just this week that Portillo's announced that they're putting their own delivery system together um, that will deliver for, for their operations. Uh, I mean, look, we third party delivery had issues before COVID. Um, the, the fee structure just really isn't sustainable for most operators. Uh, and COVID has only heightened that. Uh, so I think we'll see consolidation in the third party sector uh, and we'll see some very creative options, but it, it may be probably six to 12 months before we really see that play out. Can I top on to his question? Because you all mentioned something quite interesting. We were going to third party delivery systems because it was just a quick fix, right? Now you're saying that some are developing their own delivery systems. And Dr. Bone mentioned we need to pay better salaries. We need to 
maybe provide more benefits, right? So we're, again, not trying to be a, a pessimist, but I, I wonder if there's an opportunity for more fragmentation of providing services so that it's easier for the restaurant to be able to succeed. Because what's, I, I'm a concerned that as municipalities have lost sales tax uh, revenue, occupancy tax revenue, which is huge, um, other things are going to creep up that they can't necessarily pass on to the customer, like, you know, property taxes or even state income taxes in some, in some segments. And so how do you, you know, work that pressure? I'm in agreement with you that if you're able to provide better benefits and other things, the employees are, are going to look at that industry and say, this is a great, because they love what they do, right? You're passionate about it. That's why you're in it. But do you see segmentation, not just maybe not bringing and delivering house, but maybe other ways that restaurant owners are going to find to, to overcome some of these pressures from cost to still make a profit? Well, I think one of the th things is that you might not be paying high real estate costs for, for your delivery. Um, so you might find the, the ghost restaurants or the restaurants going back in the warehouse districts where they can get cheap labor, they can set up essentially a commissary manufacturing type operation for deliveries and reduce costs that way, rather than take a prime location um, and then try to run both deliveries and sit down service out of that same location. And, and eventually you might see, uh, as we're starting to see anyways, uh, delivery only restaurants starting to come up as, as well. Yeah, I really appreciate y'all's responses. Um, I, I really feel bad for all these restaurants, you know, these owners who have saved, you know, their money for 30, 40 years, decided to open a restaurant. And now they're all just being shut down. So definitely breaks my heart. And I've definitely been paying really close attention. So I really do appreciate y'all's responses. Thank you so much, Phil. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Now we have Layla. Layla, can you hear us? Layla, you said, oh, perfect. Yeah, it's, hi. Hi, I'm Layla Hartzorster, a graduate of 87, Dr. Bowen's former assistant. Uh, I have a question. I, I work in a, in a hotel in Los Angeles. It's a luxury hotel. We've been open all along. Uh, never closed restaurant and bar. Uh, we've set them up outside. And um, I wanted to mention about room service. Most of our revenue comes from room service at the moment. Um, but uh, I have an entirely uh, different question. Now uh, that, for example, when the occupancy rates are about 25% in many hotels here in, in LA, probably so as well in Houston, um, uh, uh, now when we slowly reopen, uh, do you think the uh, robots will, the, the, the COVID will speed up the uh, process of robots coming in in, um, many areas, housekeeping, uh, et cetera, because hotels are very labor intensive. So that's. I, I don't, Dr. Kripta Franklin can, can <laughs> chime in. I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's still cost prohibitive to do that. The cost has to come down significantly for that to happen. And I don't think that the robots, um, they can't do everything that a housekeeper does. You know, there's some things that they still don't. I think a couple of years back um, at, what, at the Alice Conference actually in Los Angeles, um, there was a startup company that was doing like the Zumba, the Roombas, you know, that you have mm -hmm. at home for the rooms. Right. Yeah. And I, I think while there's a pattern to it, it doesn't completely clean the room. And that wasn't a cheap option either. Um, I also have what, what someone referred to as the creepy factor. There was a little camera in there that would <laughs> sort of check and see what was going on in the room as far as looking for, 
you know, paint or things like that. But if you had other things in your room, it would, it would see that too. <laughs> so yeah, I yeah. personally think, no, we're still far away from that because the cost is too high. And I don't think people perceive that as if it, an owner doesn't necessarily perceive that as making them money. It, it may reduce some costs, but um, the cost of the, the technology is not is high and the technology itself is not a hundred percent there. Dr. DeFranco. And it's, it just depends on what type and totally the, the price right now is quite prohibitive. You know, that's why I kind of said some of the, the ideas like the, the shoe sanitizing machine that looks great, but $25,000. So who has $25,000 when, you know, we're trying to just stay surviving mode right now, but there are some that might be able to have those robots. So the, the, like the, the tug robot for the um, luggage, that was 2018 at the Sheraton in Los Angeles. Um, there are some robots that are delivering things already, you know, um, from towels to toothpaste and toothbrushes and all that, little things. Now, is it totally robot, Lila? I don't think so. I totally agree with Arlene on that part. But if the robots come down, if the manufacturer thinking, hey, this is the way because it's sanitation, all those less touch and so on, let's just look at volume versus cost and drop the cost down. Then it might be helpful. But I totally agree. The robots are more of a, a fun thing to have and it's a great mm -hmm. thing to have. Um, in some hotels, we hear stories that, um, especially the kids, they just want to call up and have the robots to deliver things to them. And they want to <laughs> hug the robots and all that. Yeah. And it's, it's for that factor. But for the long run, unless the costs come down, um, it will be difficult. Um, but Dr. Bowen has a research project on robots too. And maybe he can also help us a little bit on this answer. I, I think there are certain uses. It, it, again, a lot seems to be using a well where, where you have a limited service operation, basically one person at the front and you have the grab and go so the robot can deliver a grab and go up to the room. It's fairly simple. Um, you know, you don't have the human interaction with robots. So I think you'll see them use less in upscale hotels. And there might be more in the, the back of the house. And I think it's it has to be an integrated system too. There's a restaurant chain, um, and they might even be out where you are, and I can't recall the name of it now, but it's, um, they produce hamburger restaurant, hamburgers, but the whole thing is done by a machine. So yeah. you can tell it what you want on it, the condiments and so on. So I think yeah. you'll see more of the integrated okay, approach yeah. rather than, or, a robot flipping hamburgers back and forth, but in this case, a whole machine that makes the, the end product. And that way, it's a lot more accurate than a person and you get the people there interacting with the customers more be, because they have the uh, time to, to do that. So I think the other thing is smart machines. I think that there are machines now where if you, we have your mobile phone number and you text down to the front desk and want something, that it can be answered by a machine. So if you want to know what time the restaurant opens, the machine can answer it back. So I think we'll see applications like that as well. And you know what other thing, Lala, which is interesting, you know, one of the, the, the news things was the robots in that Tokyo hotel, I think it was, it was like a dinosaur and some other people and they look lifelike. Um, they fired the robots because they were too expensive to fix. So talk about health insurance costs. I guess the cost of repairing the robot was, was, was causing them to not really be able to save them money. And there were some things like Xeroxing or copying the passports that they do for international people that the robot couldn't do. Of course, you could probably get around those things, but that's something else that when you do get technology, if it's not been around a long time what is the life of the technology and what is the you know how when you buy a new house and you for you don't think oh this is a great price and you forget you need curtains and <laughs> you know different things what is the all in ownership cost of the robot yeah thank you very much Next up, we have Janelle. Oh, 
Hello, my name is uh, Jignal Shah and I'm a junior currently. I'll be graduating in 2022. And my question was, so in terms of recruitment, uh, what advice do you have for students for the future? Like what skills would they need to build to accustom themselves to the new normal so that they can be of value to the, to the business that they join? And I think they, they need to be innovative. They need to know as much about technology as possible. Um, I'm gonna let other faculty members jump in on this. <laughs> uh, and I, I think one thing is that you need to be flexible. Okay, you, you need to look at just different things, not just I come here for just working in hotels. No, there are so many other things. And Dr. Dawson mentioned it too, is that whatever you learn here, that skill set has, we, we do so many things with you all when you're here, is that that skill set can be used for so many different things, not just the hotel, restaurant, country clubs, and so on. It can be in other management, it can be in retail, it can be in a lot of different things, not even in hospitality even, because if you look at it, this is a specialized business degree that you're getting, Jigan. So be open. Don't look at just hotel and restaurants, although that's where we are concentrating. But there are a lot of other things that you can do too. And I will add that uh, soft skills will never go away. Uh, you know, and soft skills are something that unlike IQ, you can actually work on. I talk about this in class all the time. There are ways to improve your empathy or um, your listening skills, et cetera. So I, I would put a ton of emphasis on that. All the research says that your long-term career success uh, is mostly predicted on your soft skills uh, and less on your technical skills. And also, Jigny, take this opportunity to think about this new way that we're learning and teaching right now, right? We haven't experienced that before. Learn whatever you can from the current situation because that skill set of how you get engaged, how you're engaged with a panel like this, that we're not even touching each other, take that and use it later on because now you have another line on your resume that I have done this. You know, so again, take advantage of what the current situation is. Don't look at it on the other side and go, well, you know, nothing is working and you know, all these things are negative, but look at the positive things. And as Dr. Dawson said, keep on learning. Gosh, we are still, you know, even at our age, we're still learning. But that never stopped. That never stopped. I mean, the good news in answering that for you is, is, is there's a number of people on this call as well as alumni that I've kept in touch with that have transferred those skills beyond hospitality and advance quickly because they know how to interact, they know how to manage people and interact with customers, other stakeholders, and they're using those type of skills. So that's true for you. I, my brother-in-law was a general manager in a restaurant and I was shocked when he told me he was a branch manager for a Bank of America and I go how did you transfer from one to another he said because I can manage people and I was I'm, I've improved customer service at my location he goes the other people that work for me know how to do the day-to-day -day banking I know how to run the operation and I, I was just shocked when he said that to me but then the, as I saw him advance in his career I saw how transferable those skills were and just to add to the bandwagon, look for any opportunity that there is. This summer we did the hackathon and we also had opportunity for some students to be meeting planners and they are, they're not getting paid. This is no, this is all volunteer. They are interacting with industry people as they're setting up the meetings. They're learning how to do webinars, just like the students who are gonna be doing the online the job fair, career fair. They are learning how to use Microsoft Teams. And you can't discount knowing any of those things because you never know when you're gonna do it. And so while something may not pay you, it doesn't mean that it won't pay you forward when you need it later in the future. And you can say, I know how to do that. So totally positive.
Thank you. Uh, we, we still have more questions left. Unfortunately, we're running on close to the second hour. Um, so I did type my email address uh, in the chat box. You can email me the question and we'll do our best to, our, uh, to answer them. And if you have future, uh, any suggestions for future webinar, uh, we would love to have them as well. Um, please email me uh, your suggestions as well as uh, your feedback for, for this webinar. We will really appreciate it. Uh, this um, webinar uh, will be on our college's uh, YouTube website uh, as well as under the repository uh, as a resource for our alumni and uh, students. And uh, lastly, I want to thank all the professors uh, for being here and sharing their uh, knowledge and wisdom and expertise. Um, and uh, thank you for all the attendees uh, spending uh, this time with us during a, a very interesting time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. I'll take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.